When you think about dogs and the lone woman and San Nicolas Island, you automatically conjure up images similar to this. Images of a rocky shoreline, coast, a Nicolaino woman with black hair pulled back, and of course, her furry companion. And this image of the dog is seen in each one of these covers. And it's, it's portrayed here very wolf-like. And this dog is actually the village dog uh, from northern Canada and Alaska. Its characteristics include very large size, thick coat, erect ears, and a tail that turns back over its body. And when we really look at the historical accounts of the dogs that were with Juana Maria, we understand that the descriptions point to a dog that was coyote-like, thin, brown, tan, with a downturn tail. And those descriptions do not describe this dog, but they describe a dog similar to this. This is a sculpture of Juana Maria and um, her Plains Indian dog with her. This dog is a lot smaller. Uh, it has a thin coat, it is tan and brown, and in these images, you can see that it has a downturned tail. Much different than the previous images in the book covers of the wolf-like dog. And you can also see that it has a very prognathic snout. That's much different than the broad uh, facial description of the wolf-like dog. So these dogs are very different. For the book, the fictional account, that dog makes sense. But in reality, these dogs were the dogs that were on the island. And you can also see in the plains where they originated, they were working dogs. They were carrying things. Uh, they were involved in hunting with the uh, Native Americans there. So they were very active. This project started about five years ago when I started going to local museums, San Diego Museum of Man, Santa Barbara Natural History Museum, and uh, uh, skeletons that Lisa had on San Nicolas Island. I just started measuring the elements uh, per von den Dreisch, just taking any element that I could get and measuring it. Uh, after, after five years, I had about 5,000 elements that were uh, measured. And I had to, in some way, narrow this down to give me a sample that I would be able to use to compare it to other previous literature. Um, and what I did was, first of all, I took out all the juveniles because uh, there's so much difference in juvenile canine skeletons. I got rid of those, first of all. Second, we had to determine sex. And for uh, the majority of the individuals, there was not the presence of a baculum, which would mean male immediately or the pelvis, and if you had those, it would be very easy to tell male or female, but for the most part, those did not exist. So the other markers that I used uh, were uh, skeletal markers on the basio-occipital portion of the skull, which you see up here at the bottom of the skull. Uh, the defined sagittal crest, the defined sagittal crest like that, this would be male. A female would not have that and also a very defined condyloid ridge on the mandible. Uh, these are very good markers to determining whether or not it is male or female. And once I had these characteristics, I then put them through all sorts of statistics, uh, regression formulae, all these things, and you get percentages. And what exactly do the percentages mean? And I started plotting different characteristics of the dogs, uh, the different skull morphologies and the height and things like that. And I started plotting them onto scatter plots like this. This is a scatter plot representing uh, cranial morphology, the zygomatic width uh, by the total length. And I originally anticipated that there would be one dog species, the plain Indian dog, on the island. But as you can see, there's two loosely associated um, groups or um, clusters of um, individuals. This was very interesting. So when I plotted the next um, set of characteristics, the facial characteristics, or the face of the dog, we see these clusters starting to tighten. And that became very interesting to me. Was there different populations of dogs? Were these at different locations on the island? And from all that I could see, they were, um, these dogs were scattered across the island, and they weren't in any specific locations. And we can see the clusters are starting to tighten. And it became extremely interesting once we plot the height of the dog. On the y-axis, we have the humerus length. and the x-axis, we have femoral length. So that would have been the height of the dog. 
And you guys can see how these clusters become extremely tight. And from that point, I knew we had two different dog breeds, one smaller, one larger. There's, and you can see that the clusters are very tightly packed. There was no mongrelization. There was no interbreeding of these dogs. There was two specific dog breeds on the island at the time of Juana Maria. And these are what the two dogs would have looked like. The plain Indian dog, which I mentioned before, has a very prognathic snout, a very large skull. Whereas the short-nosed Indian dog is a lot more gracile. It has a shortened rostrum, and, uh, which is characteristic and why it is called the short-nosed Indian dog. After, after looking at the size, a lot of dogs are very similar in size to each other. And just because the measurements of the bones matched up to these type of dogs, I really couldn't uh, just settle at that. I really had to look for the morphologic characteristics to really hammer this down. And here, for the Plains Indian dog, in all the um, literature, they said there's a very high percentage of missing premolars. You can see how it has the first premolar on this side and not on this side. And when I looked at the skeletons and the skulls of the Plains Indian dog, I realized that there is an 86% occurrence of this trait within the dogs. And at that point, I could almost be certain that this was the Plains Indian dog. The other dog that's represented is the short-nosed Indian dog. And this dog is actually very interesting. It originates in the American Southwest and is seen in a very small range. So the fact that it does, in fact, end up on San Nicolas Island raises a lot of questions. Um, this right here is a mummified dog skeleton from a cave in Arizona. So we actually get to see its fur color and how the morphology would have been. On San Nicolas Island, we have different soils, different preservation conditions, and we don't get the, um, the luxury of seeing what this dog actually looks like. Here we have a Jack Russell, which is a modern breed, but this is really going to give you an idea of what the short-nosed Indian dog would have looked like. It's very compact, very small, very quick. And so these two different dogs are very different in their morphology, in their body type, and all that type of thing. So why did these dogs end up on the island? And the other the, one of the characteristics to really nail down that we had the short-nosed dog was a torsional rotation of the premolars. And as you can see here, we get that because of the shortening of the rostrum. It has a very short snout, so you get a crowding of the dental arcade. You can also see that here. There's no teeth there, but you can see in the root canals how the root canals are rotated torsionally, crammed behind the tooth in front of it. And for this occurrence, we had a 91% occurrence of this trait. And so at that point, we knew the short-nosed dog was represented in the, in the assemblage. And I had always read about different shapes of these dogs for Eamon Magni. And I didn't really think that I would see it. This is the short-nosed Indian dog. And it was said that it has a notch in the um, superior portion of the frame and magnum. And in all but one skull, we have the notch in the frame and magnum. And that really right there really was the kicker for me. Here we have the Plains Indian dog. And in all previous literature, it says it's a very ovoid um, frame and magnum without any notch. And you can see here, no notch. And we see this in every skull except for one of these various dogs. And that really allows us to uh, nail these down. And these are the two dogs that were on the island. Where do we go with this research? Well, here's a map of the distribution of these aboriginal dog breeds across the United States. You can see the village dog is all the way up here, and the Plains Indian dog centered here, with a little swath coming out to San Nicolas Island. Now, when looking at this, that was very interesting to me. Why does a dog from the Plains end up on a coastal island in Southern California? And for this, I really look to the distribution of these dogs through time. In the middle period, we have uh, the Plains Indian dog appearing pretty heavily in the archaeological record, but we have no short-nosed Indian dog. Once the late period, then we have the onset of the short-nosed Indian dog. So one of the ideas that I was thinking about, and in the future research I'll be knocking around, is did these dogs were traded out to the island at a later time, did they start trading for these dogs in the American Southwest, since this swath goes right through that area? Did they use the larger dogs for hunting 
or for other things on the island, but later they wanted a smaller dog for a more specialized purpose. Were these dogs being used like artifacts, like spear points? Were they being used to hunt specific game to carry um, sea mammals up from the shore? We don't really know these questions yet, but these dogs were very specialized and they were utilized by the Native Americans in very different ways. And here, um, a lot of the people in our lab, and I have to thank them for doing this research, looking at the pathology Elizabeth Netherton has been doing this research, is that we can look at the skeletal markers of these animals and really determine what were they doing. We don't have any ethnographic accounts of what they were doing on the island, so we really have to look to their skeletons. And here you can see a thoracic vertebrae um, that has osteophytosis pretty bad, and that's the result of arthritis. And we see this um, occurrence um, in dogs that are working dogs, dogs that are pulling things, dogs that have a lot of pressure on the vertebral column uh, for, oh, for long periods of time. And we see this in, um, in a lot of the dogs, and even in dogs that are not very old, we see uh, these type of skeletal markers. We also see a lot of broken and re-healed bones, such as, such as ribs. And we know that these dogs were working, they were active uh, every day, they were breaking bones, they were healing bones, and that type of thing. And what's really cool, down here we have a dog scapula with a puncture wound. And we think that maybe these dogs were hurting sea lions, things like that, and would have resulted in a puncture wound to the scapular area. But what's even more interesting about this is that you actually see healing. And this, this wound would have uh, rendered the dog incapable of walking for a serious period of time. And in order to get this bone regrowth, you would have had to have cared for the dog. It wouldn't have been able to fend for itself. And in the dog's stomach contents, we actually see burnt fish. Unlike, even today, you probably wouldn't cook a meal for your dog, but back then, they actually had fish that these people were going out and, and fishing, bringing it back, and cooking it for the dogs in order to give it to them. As Renee previously mentioned, these dogs were very specialized. These dogs were cared for, and these dogs were loved by these people. We also can see here a burial uh, of one of the dogs, and we find these burials in um, burials in conjunction with human or ceremonial context. We very rarely see these burials in midden. In all my research, I've only seen two elements associated with midden, whereas in the eastern United States, dogs were eaten and cast away. Here, we don't see that. Here, we see ceremonial burials and also burials in conjunction with humans. So on San Nicolas Island, what we can walk away with is the dogs of Juana Maria were very specialized. They were very cared for. They were given the resources that they needed in order to do the job that they needed to be done, whether it was hunting, whether it was carrying things, or otherwise. Um, so in the future research, hopefully we can shed some light on these issues. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>